Hey everybody, welcome back to session two of Hope in the Dark. Last week we talked about those times when you're asking, where are you God? We agreed that it's okay to ask those tough questions and wrestle with God sometimes because let's be honest, God's not going to get his feelings hurt. He's got big shoulders and he can handle it whatever you ask him. But here's the thing. What do you do when you've asked all your questions, you've wrestled, and still nothing changes? What comes next? Okay, brace yourself. You ready? You have to wait. You have to wait. Now let's be honest. No one likes to wait. I mean, I can't think of a worse way to spend my day than sitting in a waiting room. Have you ever seen a happy person in a waiting room? Nope, because we all hate to wait. But there are times where we have to go through those seasons of waiting. So what do you do in the waiting season? Well, first of all, you listen. You start by listening. You pause, you get quiet, and you ask God to speak to you. You listen with two ears and you say nothing. You see, here's the thing. God's got the answers. He can give you a whole new perspective on your situation, bring you hope, and even some peace. Because when you stop and listen, sometimes, sometimes, you'll hear that still small voice in your heart, and it's crystal clear. And those moments are so powerful. But most of the time, if you want to hear from God, the only one sure way that you can do that is when you open up the Bible, God's Word. You have a whole book full of the words that God has already spoken, and they're still true today. Now, if you're not sure where to start, the book of John is a great place. It's all about the life of Jesus, and it's jam-packed with hope. Or, if you're more of an app person, download the YouVersion Bible app and find a reading plan that speaks to your situation. And as you do that, you'll learn to listen to God's whispers while you wait. Now, God must have known that we were going to go through these seasons of waiting because there are all kinds of stories in the Bible of people who had to wait. Remember Daniel from last week? He lived in Jerusalem about 500 years before Jesus, and life was going great for him until his whole world fell apart when a foreign king invaded his homeland. He was stuck in a far off place, far from home, with no clue if he'd ever get out. Have you ever been there before? Just waiting and waiting and waiting, not knowing what is next? He was in a waiting season. So, what did he do? What did he do? He opened up scriptures and he started listening to God. And guess what? He found something that made his jaw drop. In Daniel chapter 9, it says that he was meditating on the scriptures, specifically the words of the prophet Jeremiah. And this is what he found. He looked at scripture and he realized that God had already spoken about his situation. God had told Jeremiah before it even happened that Jerusalem would be destroyed. And he said that it would lie in ruins for 70 years. Yeah, you heard me right. 70 years. I can just imagine Daniel's face like, come on, God. Are you serious? 70 years? I can't wait that long. But Daniel didn't give up. He decided to seek out an answer from God, so he got quiet. He prayed, and he listened. And God responded. He responded in a big way. He sent Gabriel, the same angel from the Christmas story, to deliver a message to Daniel. And Gabriel said to him, You had no sooner started your prayer when the answer was given. I'm here to deliver the answer to you. You are much much loved. Wow. Is that not reassurance or what? God was saying to Daniel, I'm listening. I care. I love you. And then God gave Daniel a promise that would stretch far beyond his lifetime. 
He told him that Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And not only that, but he promised that 483 years later, an anointed leader would come and would save his people. And you know who that person was? Jesus Christ. Exactly 483 years later, Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling the promise, giving hope to the world because God's timing is impeccable. So, if you're stuck in a waiting season and you're ready to pull out your hair, you're done, you're over it, I just want to encourage you, take some time to listen to God. Open up your Bible or your Bible app and ask Him to speak to you. You might not get an angel showing up at your door, but you might hear those words you desperately need to hear. Words like, I love you. I will never leave you. I have good plans for you. And when you hear them, write them down. Because one day you'll be able to share those words with someone else who's stuck in their own waiting season. My good friends Ben and Sierra went through a grueling time of a waiting season years ago, but they kept listening to God and His words gave them hope. And as you listen to their story, I pray that your hope in your season of waiting would be answered, and you would be encouraged. So take a moment right now and listen to Ben and Sierra's story. I'm Sierra, and I'm the Assistant Director of Children's Ministry at The Jar, and together we have our beautiful daughter, Emily, who's three years old. I prayed all the time to get pregnant and I would sit a lot and like, why me, God? Like, why, why am I not allowed to have a child? Faith was not such a big part of my life at that time. So I was more just angry at myself and wondering what I did wrong. I think it was a really rough time in our marriage too, because I think we were blaming ourselves and I think in the back of our minds we were blaming each other. and. You know, I know like as far, as far as the faith part goes, you know, I was also at the same time like, well, maybe if, you know, we just believed a little bit more, or maybe if Ben actually believed and, you know, maybe if we prayed together. And, but I mean, at that point, I think we were both still in a, like in a season of searching. Um, I'd grown up in the church and he had too, but we had to totally different experiences. We were pregnant, we were excited. Um, and then we really didn't know that anything was different um, up until the day before she was born. So it was a pretty normal pregnancy um, up until 29 weeks. Um, on June 3rd, I went to the doctor because I wasn't feeling 100%. I was still working. I went in and I said, you know, I just don't feel right. Um, I said, I, I can't breathe very well and I think she might be up in my lungs. So I just wanna like check on her and make sure things are okay. And um, the lady that I saw, she said, well, everything looks great. She said, your blood pressures are fine. Your heart rate's fine. Um, you know, the baby seems great. She's like, but let's, let's send you to the hospital just to double check. And when I got there, I got into the ER and they started taking my blood pressure. And the nurse kept going, how, do you, how are you feeling? Are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I feel great. I'm like, I don't feel wrong or anything. And um, when they finally got me back into the room, my mom was with me at this point. They finally got me back into the room and um, they started like strapping pa like pads to the sides of the bed. And I said, well, what are, what are those for? And she said, well, your blood pressure is 210 over 198. You're about to have a stroke. And so I was just going through my day like normal. And I opened up one of the uh, truck bay doors because I needed some air. And all of a sudden my phone started going off. I had like 10 missed calls, six text messages, packed up my truck and left from there. Um, got to the hospital and then they were telling us, yeah, so you're going to be in bed rest at the hospital until 34 weeks, at which point we'll do a scheduled C-section uh, that'll give her time 
for her lungs and brain and heart and everything to develop to a proper amount that we can take her a little early and everything will be fine. And then flight crew walked in, threw me off, and they said, yeah, there's no ground transport available, so uh, you're gonna be flown to St. Vincent Women's on 86th Street in Indianapolis. And I'm like, okay, so maybe this is a little worse than I had thought. That's when I started feeling sick, very, very sick. And it was at that point that they couldn't find her heart rate. And so that at that point is when they said, uh, we have to take her right now. Um, and they wheeled me out of the room. It was not a typical C-section. I remember looking at them and saying, please don't let me die. And please don't let her die. I don't want to die. And I fell asleep. And she was here 10 minutes later. <laughs> One of the nurses comes in, tells me I have a daughter and that I can go see her. Uh, they had her in one of those little, I call it a baking bag, like what you put a roast in to keep it warm in the oven. They had her basically in one of those. For the first three days, um, I actually refused to go see her um, because I was afraid because I didn't want to make a connection with somebody I was going to lose. So <laughs> I did not get to actually physically see her until she was three days old. And it was surreal um, to see this tiny little baby, two pounds, 10 ounces. And I finally was able to go up to her and put my finger in there for her and she just grabbed onto it and she had such a strong grip that I just knew things were gonna be okay. So I think a lot of things that people take for granted, you know, um, we didn't get to experience. Still a lot of guilt and a lot of... Um, why us? Yeah, why God? Like I did everything perfect, you know, I, I prayed and I... I did all of these things, you know, why? And I don't think unless you've been in like a NICU setting, you don't really understand like, or I mean, you might, it's hard to comprehend being down there and seeing like your child and the child right next to her could be on seven or eight machines and uh, you know, a trach and oxygen and something pumping the child's heart for them and seeing your child going, we're just one step away from that. When I tell you that I have never sat and prayed, and I'm gonna be honest, I have never shook my fist at God so much in my life. I, how dare you do this to my baby? How dare you do this to me? Why, what did I do? What did I do in my life that would cause my baby to be sitting there fighting for her life? That was probably the first time that I had legitimately just given up and prayed. Like I knew there was nothing else I could do, so I just had to hand it over. I'm a massive control freak, and it was completely out of my control. And what do we do when things are completely out of control? We call out to God. I mean, whether it be shaking your fist or whether it be, you know, praising Him or, I mean, that's, that's what we do. And that's what I did is I just, I just sat there and <laughs> I was out of the hospital at this point. I don't think I would have come to the conclusion in the hospital, but out of the hospital, you just kind of have to sit and go, maybe things needed to be out of my control so that I could grow closer to God. And maybe things needed to be the way they were because God needed me. And who, when I started realizing that, boy, did things start getting better. <laughs> I mean, just my outlook on things. It's amazing, like, it sounds kind of cliche, but like, it's amazing the things that you can do when you realize that God is doing things for you and not working against you. I saw a side of the church that I had not seen in the past. Um, shortly after she was born, 
Chris detoured his whole family. They were on their way to Florida and he came up to the hospital because the only person allowed up there with us was pastors, um, medical personnel and pastors. So he stopped and they probably sat in the car for an hour while he talked to us and just gave us support. Um, and that was a side of the church and of faith that I hadn't seen in the past. It was just refreshing, maybe? I don't know quite the word, but it was definitely welcome and it definitely brought us closer. Um, we hadn't been a part of the church for very long, really. I mean, we really didn't know a whole lot of people. And when you realize that, like, the pastor of a church detoured their entire family vacation, like, who does that, <laughs> you know? I mean, I know that, like, I've never experienced somebody doing that. We've never experienced outreach like that. And, I, like, it, I know it meant the world to me, and I know, like, Ben's never been like a church person and that flipped a switch, I think. It's not about religion, it's about relationships. We start developing all these relationships and didn't really lean into it until that point that we had her. I'm definitely at a different point in my walk than her or anybody else. Um, you know, I do pray, I do let him just take what he needs to take, and I just uh, try to love my neighbor and do what I can. Probably feels like uh, Peter, the first steps off the boat when Jesus told to, to walk with him on water. It's like, you know, that apprehension was there, and then all of a sudden you look down, you just can't look down. You just gotta trust it. So that's how I handle things, is I just trust that things will happen as he wants them to, and I handle what I can. This is the closest I have ever felt with God in my life. And honestly, it is all because of my daughter. You know, a little peanut, like we call her. A little <laughs> peanut, you know, recommitted my life to Jesus. He was so, so faithful and so good, even when I doubted him. And that's just, it's just a beautiful thing. Hey everybody. Well, like Ben and Sierra just shared, waiting on God is tough, but it's so much better when you have a group of people around you to support you. And the people sitting around your circle are there to sit with you in whatever waiting season you're going through. But if you find yourself struggling with overwhelming emotions while you wait, I wanna invite you to come to Abundant Hope, the JAR's emotional healing group. And you can sign up for that on the JAR app. Well, enjoy the rest of your time with group and always know that you are not alone.